Good morning and welcome to Walking with Jesus Through the Word, one chapter per day. I am Pastor Jason Van Bevel from Forest Hill Presbyterian Church. It is our 942nd day together in the Word of God, and we come to Jeremiah 52. This is the end of this substantial major prophet that we've been in for months now, it seems like. Um, let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your word and for the prophet Jeremiah and for all that we've learned in 51 chapters so far. And as we come to this final chapter, please prepare our hearts to receive by faith the word that you have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Jeremiah 52. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hamutai, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that Jehoiakim had done. For because of the anger of the Lord, it came to the point in Jeremiah and Judah that he cast them out from his presence. And Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon, and in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, on the tenth day of the month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came with all his army against Jerusalem and laid siege to it. And they built siege works all around it. So the city was besieged until the eleventh year of King Zedekiah. On the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine was so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land. Then a breach was made in the city. And all the men of war fled and went out from the city by night by the way of the gate between the two walls, by the king's garden, and the Chaldeans were around the city. And they went in the direction of the Araba, but the army of the Chaldeans pursued the king and overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho, and all his army was scattered from him. Then they captured the king and brought him up to the king of Babylon at Riblah in the land of Hamath. And he passed sentence on him. The king of Babylon slaughtered the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes and also slaughtered all the officials of Judah at Riblah. He put out the eyes of Zedekiah and bound him in chains. And the king of Babylon took him to Babylon and put him in prison till the day of his death. In the fifth month, on the tenth day of the month, that was the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Nebuzaradan, the captain of the garden, who served the king of Babylon, entered Jerusalem. And he burned the house of the Lord and the king's house and all the houses of Jerusalem. Every great house he burned down. And all the army of the Chaldeans, who were with the captain of the guard, broke down all the walls around Jerusalem. And Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carried away captive some of the poorest of the people and the rest of the people who were left in the city and the deserters who had deserted to the king of Babylon together with the rest of the artisans. But Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, left some of the poorest in the land to be vine dressers and plowmen. And the pillars of bronze that were in the house of the Lord and the stands and the bronze sea that were in the house of the Lord, the Chaldeans broke in pieces and carried all the bronze to Babylon. And they took away the pots and the shovels and the snuffers and the basins and the dishes for incense and all the vessels of bronze used in the temple service. And also the small bowls and the fire pans and the basins and the pots and the lampstands and the dishes for incense and the bowls for drink offerings. What was of gold, the captain of the guard took away as gold. What was of silver, as silver. As for the two pillars, the one sea, and the twelve bronze bulls that were under the sea, and the stands which Solomon the king made for the house of the Lord, the bronze of all these things was beyond weight. As for the pillars, the height of one pillar, excuse me, the height of the one pillar was eighteen cubits, its circumference was twelve cubits, and its thickness was four fingers, and it was hollow. On it was a capital of bronze. The height of the one capital was five cubits, a network, and pomegranates all of bronze were around the capital, and the second pillar had the same with the pomegranates. There were ninety-six pomegranates on the sides. All the pomegranates were a hundred upon the network all around. And the captain of the guard took Sareah, the chief priest, and Zephaniah, the second priest, and the three keepers of the threshold, 
And from the city he took an officer who had been in command of the men of war, and seven men of the king's council who were found in the city, and the secretary of the commander of the army who mustered the people of the land, and sixty men of the people of the land who were found in the midst of the city. And Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, took them and brought them to the king of Babylon at Riblah. And the king of Babylon struck them down and put them to death at Riblah in the land of Hamath. So Judah was taken into exile out of its land. This is the number of the people whom Nebuchadnezzar carried away captive in the seventh year, 3,023 Judeans. In the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar, he carried away captive from Jerusalem 832 persons. In the 23rd year of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carried away captive of the Judeans 745 persons. All the persons were 4,600. And in the 37th year of the exile of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, in the 12th month, on the 25th day of the month, Evil Merodach, king of Babylon, in the year that he began to reign, graciously freed Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and brought him out of prison. And he spoke kindly to him, and gave him a seat above the seats of the kings who were with him in Babylon. So Jehoiakim put off his prison garments, and every day of his life he dined regularly at the king's table. And for his allowance, a regular allowance, was given him by the king according to his daily needs until the day of his death, as long as he lived. Hmm. Jeremiah 52. And if you're thinking, as I was reading that, this sounds familiar. Haven't we already heard this in the book of Jeremiah? The answer to that question is yes. In chapter 39 of Jeremiah, we had a recounting of much of this same material about the fall of Jerusalem and the Nebuchadnezzar and the captain of the guard taking people captive. But we do get different details here. But there is like a culmination of Jeremiah's prophecies in chapter 39. Then we get some history and then sort of a coming back. Some of these later prophecies were given in Egypt and then some of them were from earlier and they're sort of put together later. So it's an unusual structure to the book of Jeremiah. It's not straightly linear from beginning to end. But we have here the end of Jerusalem. Uh, and it's told to us twice, I think, really to emphasize that the Lord is in control of this, that this all happened according to his word, and to give some hope to the people who are in exile. We do in this chapter go years beyond where the earlier chapters of Jeremiah Ended. And while the earlier chapters of Jeremiah had us following Jeremiah and some of the people who were left in Judah and Jerusalem as they fled to Egypt, here we're following the earlier exiles in the other direction off to Babylon. So 39 and 40 and 41, we're going down to Egypt with that group. Here we're going up to Babylon with that group. And so there is a, a balancing here of what happens after the fall to these two different groups. And here we're given this, this hopeful ending um, that we'll talk about uh, in, just, in just a little bit. So Zedekiah, he is, he's king. Uh, Jehoiakim had been king before him. And he just basically decides that he's going to act out of pride and rebellion and, and disobedience and sin. He's an idolater like his father before him. And he rebels against the king of Babylon. And again, we have divine sovereignty, human responsibility, both happening here. Did Zedekiah rebel against the king of Babylon because God was wanting to send Jerusalem into exile and to destroy the temple? Yes. Did Zedekiah rebel against the king of Babylon because he was proud and sinful and wanted to rebel against the king of Babylon? Yes. Divine sovereignty doesn't undermine our human responsibility, but it rather establishes it. It's God who gives us the ability to be able to do what we want, and it still fall within his greater purposes. So it really reinforces this idea that we, God is in control, and 
we are responsible for our actions. So, you know, there's a siege that lasts for a while, about a year and a half, a little more than a year and a half. Any city under siege, it's not a, it's not an easy thing. Um, but in the end, it's not because Jerusalem is starved to death and they surrender, although they certainly were in deep distress, but it's because a breach was made in the city and the men of war fled and went out of the city. Once the breach was made, if you're a fighting man, you figure you're dead meat, so you're going to try to get out of the city while you can. And they head in the direction of the Arabah, that's south, away from the invading Babylonian army. But they're overtaken in the plains of Jericho, which is kind of to the southeast, not that far away from Jerusalem. In other words, they didn't get far. And this same account that we had before in chapter 39, the sons of Zedekiah are slaughtered before his eyes, and then his eyes are put out. Um, this, unlike what we had in chapter 39, here in chapter 52, we have a much more specific accounting of the thorough destruction of the temple. So chapter 39 had told us about the city being destroyed and everything being destroyed. But here we have more detail about the destruction of the temple itself. And it really is just a sad, sad day. We think about Solomon building this temple, but that would have been 400 years prior to this. And, you know, imagine something that stood for 400 years. We don't have any buildings in America that really have been standing and in continual use for 400 years. 400 years takes us back to 1624, and so you would have had Jamestown, and you would have had Plymouth, but none of the buildings from those early days are still around anymore. You go over to Europe, and there are certainly buildings that have been around for more than 400 years, but 400 years is a long time. That's what I'm saying. And so the temple's been in operation for a long time, and yet all of it's taken. All of these bronze and, and silver and gold, that the, we're told that the the gold is taken away as gold, and the silver is taken away as silver, which means the really precious metals, they're melting down and taking down as gold, not as what they were made out of. Now, apparently some of the vessels were kept intact because years later, Belshazzar is going to have this feast with some of these vessels. It could be the ones that are bronze that were not melted down, but it could have been that earlier... Before this, this is the final sacking of the temple. It could have been that earlier when Nebuchadnezzar came in, he took the most precious gold ones, and he kept those as sort of trophies of war, and those are the ones that Belshazzar was using. But we're given all this detail about how much was uh, was used, and just, just the bronze itself is, is just amazing. These pillars are, are massive, right? They're uh, 18 cubits. So a cubit is about... Somewhere between a foot and a half and 20 inches. But we could just say a foot and a half, right? So if it's 18 cubits, that means it's 27 feet tall. And 12 cubits is the circumference across the middle. So 12, that would be um, 18 feet across. And a thickness of four fingers. So, so the bronze was was you know, a hand breadth thick all the way around, but it was hollow. So this is a lot of bronze. These things are heavy and it's really just massive. And it just, it just is to sort of help the people because a lot of the people who are going to get this scroll and be reading it, they're maybe born in exile in Babylon, or maybe they're born in exile in Egypt. They will have never seen the temple for themselves. And so these descriptions are there to sort of remind them of what was there and what was taken. And then the people are exiled, and we're given numbers of the people who are exiled. There's three waves of the exile, year 7, year 18, year 23. And the total number is about 4,600 people who are taken to Babylon. The first wave is actually the largest, 3,000 Judeans. That, by the way, is when Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would have been taken, was in that very first wave. And... Then the second one was sort of a disciplinary action by Nebuchadnezzar. And then the third one was the final destruction of everything, where actually the smallest number of people were taken away. A lot of them were just slaughtered. Um, but in the end, here's, here's Jehoiakim, uh, Jehoiakin, 
and he is released from exile. He's released from prison. Evil Merodach is the guy who takes over after Nebuchadnezzar. Um, he reigns from 562 to 560. So in 562, which is um, 24 years after the final destruction of Jerusalem, it's the 37th year of the exile of Jehoiakim. Because remember, Jehoiakim was uh, Zedekiah's father who was taken away earlier. Um, he was, he was probably the longest imprisoned opposing king. Uh, he'd been in prison for so long. And so evil Merodach, we don't know exactly why he decided to favor him. Maybe it's just the grace of God at work. But he speaks kindly to him. He gives him a seat above the seats of the kings. He gives him uh, good garments, good food, and a regular allowance. And he's being blessed by God. And this is an encouragement. This is to tell the people in exile, God has not abandoned you. God is with you. God is keeping his promises. God will restore you. This is the 37th year. It's just about halfway through the time of their exile. They're told it was going to be 70 years. Um, and so, you know, halfway through, God gives this, this relief from the worst of it, at least for King Jehoiakim. So what do we get out of this chapter? Well, no matter how dark things are, no matter how bad things seem, no matter how weak and oppressed God's people appear to be in the world, God is still faithful. God is still carrying out his purposes. God is not panicked. God is not out of control. The world is not out of God's control. So we need to have confidence, contentment, peace, perseverance through all of these things. It may very well be the case. I'm not a prophet. I don't know what the future holds. But it may very well be the case that things for Christians in America are going to get worse in the coming years and that things in America are going to get worse in the coming years. But no matter how dark they get, and right now lots and lots of God's people all over the world have it way worse than we do and we are far too inclined to feel way too sorry for ourselves. But it may get worse. Remember how dark it got for God's people here in Jeremiah. Everything destroyed. The king's sons slaughtered. The king blinded. The temple destroyed. All the furnishings taken off into exile. The, the pagans win. And they win big time. For a long time. But God is still in control. You are never outside of his sovereign care. Therefore, you always have every reason to trust him every reason to obey him, every reason to continue to serve him faithfully and testify to the truth. You never have any reason to try to take things in your own hands, to try to make things happen because you're mad and you're not going to take it anymore. That's kind of what Zedekiah did at the beginning of the chapter that led to the final exile. So contentment, confidence, faithfulness, perseverance, knowing that the Lord really is sovereign. Those aren't just words that we say. It's the truth of the universe. Let's believe it and live it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your sovereign care of us and of all your people. Please give us the faith to trust you and to walk by faith and not in fear. Every day of our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, that's Jeremiah 52, and that's a wrap on the book of Jeremiah. Tomorrow we're going to go back to the Psalms. I hope you can join me for that. And I do hope you have a blessed day living in the confidence that comes from believing in the sovereignty of God. Mm -hmm.